So welcome everyone. I'm David Eady, the Director of Industry Engagement with the Ray C. Anderson Center for Sustainable Business, which is in the Scheller College of Business here at Georgia Tech. And I want to welcome you all here with us this morning. This is the last day of our, uh, show, our week-long showcase. And essentially, we started the week with a uh, panel that was moderated by President Angel Cabrera talking about partnerships and the importance of those in advancing the sustainable development goals. So I think it's very uh, suiting that we have some of our great corporate partners with us this morning to, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the innovative work they're doing in sustainability to advance on their priorities and some of the uh, opportunity for innovation to come into play with that and also how they uh, are currently engaged with Georgia Tech and some of the creative partnerships there. So uh, with us today, we have Dr. Jawi Abdallah, who is uh, moderating the panel. I'll pass it to him in just a second. We also have Michael Shannon, who is the CEO of Cherry Street Energy. We have Larissa Fenn, who is the Director of New Products at RIAM, formerly Rainier Advanced Materials. And we have Josh Raglan, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Norfolk Southern. So thank you all for being here, and over to you, Dr. Abdallah. Well, thank you, David. Thank you so much for being here and uh, uh, for staying until the end. Yeah, this is the best panel yet. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, it's an honor, really, for Georgia Tech to be hosting this event, the whole, the whole week uh, discussion. Uh, with, with everyone who participated, but especially today, you know, we have leaders, as you heard, from industry who are engaged in uh, sustainability and innovation. And, and uh, indeed, this is a pivotal moment in, in our history. I mean, we've been hearing about climate change. We've been hearing about the effects of it. Now we're feeling it. You know, every single one of us is, is facing or... or uh, 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 feeling the effects of what's been happening and and how it's changing uh, everything, including agriculture. I was at a meeting, uh, just got back this morning, uh, where uh, they were talking about the new crops that we have to come up with in order to deal with drought and in order to deal with floods and so on and so forth. So uh, in addition, we have dwindling, dwindling resources. Therefore, we really need to partner and we really need to come up with innovative solution to this. And, and that's why we're here as Georgia Tech. Of course, you know, our business is innovation, but we also want to partner or we need to partner with those who are on the ground really taking these solutions to market. So, uh, you know, we're going to show, hopefully through the discussion about some of the innovations that they're involved in, about the partnership with Georgia Tech, and how we can drive sustainable development and social responsibility. So let's dive right in. You know, we're not, we're not going to have a lot of introduction. I'm going to pass it to, to the panelists, and each one of them is, when I ask the question, will add maybe a little bit uh, about their role at their company. So let me, let me start first, uh, uh, start uh, the first one with Michael, and uh, maybe tell us a little bit about the top initiatives, the top priorities in your company. I know you're in this business uh, of uh, sustainability, uh, so and and also, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing these days? Of course, thank you for having me and us uh, to talk about this inflection point, but an exciting opportunity. Our corporate social responsibility uh, is our business plan. Our mission to do good and do well uh, is to incorporate renewable power uh, into and across the built environment. Um, we sell uh, renewable electricity. Mm -hmm. um, to universities um, across the region, um, municipalities as well as schools, hospitals, corporations. Um, this transition is inevitable because it's necessary for exactly the crisis that you reference, and also because if one read the newspaper this week, they'd know in the state of Georgia, uh, which is anecdotal for the country, we do not have enough electricity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to get more electricity into our system, um, and that's what we work on every day. Human capital is a primary constraint that we face, mm -hmm. um, and that's why working with innovators like Georgia Tech uh, has been critical for our business's success. Our chief technology officer, Dr. Ben Damiani, uh, received um, his PhD from here, uh, as well as a half a dozen people on our team. Um, and two businesses have come out of uh, startups in Georgia Tech that uh, support critical functions of what we do. Uh, and so the innovation and collaboration that we see here is um, so welcome, and we appreciate it. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're, you're uh, picking uh, or you're hiring from the best 
uh, engineering and uh, technology schools. So, so I think uh, you know the 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 need for talent is is actually something that not just in this area, but I think this is this is uh, extremely uh, important to to try to make sure that uh, the problems that the companies that the industry is facing uh, are being uh, addressed, or at least are the, the, are. are uh, students and our researchers are aware of them so that they can have this, uh, this communication. Yeah. Uh, well, Larissa, how about, how about you? Tell us a little bit about your challenges, the company, the role that you play there. So again, I'd like to say thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, RIAM, or Rainier Advanced Materials, has an integral relationship with Georgia Tech and the state of Georgia as well. Um, just a little background for those that may not know the company as well. We specialize in high purity cellulose from trees. So we've been doing this for almost 100 years at this point, going back all the way to the development of cellulose fibers for rayon, going into textiles. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we've always tried to make this a circular process. So we reuse as many parts of the trees, tree that we can, whether that be for energy, whether that be for other products um, to supplement the process, but also reusing the water, reusing the chemicals, you know, trying to preserve the natural environment that we find ourselves in as much as possible. And that's really our goal, giving back to the rural communities with our sustainability efforts, making sure that we can continue to thrive in these communities, but also that provides some of the challenges. Mm -hmm. We see many that do not want to cut down trees like in working forest, and what we want to do with our messaging is make sure that you know, you know, when we're talking about Jessup, Georgia, that's where I'm located down in the southeast. Mm -hmm. We've been there since the 1950s. So that's a few different cycles of trees, a few different life cycles. Mm -hmm. And what we do is whenever we utilize these trees to capture the carbon to make these forest products, we really make sure that we replant, we replenish, and then we manage these forests. And that's the messaging that we really want to ensure that everyone knows with our sustainability efforts. Thank you. Um, Josh, uh, same question. Yeah, so uh, Norfolk Southern is a transport and logistics company. Um, freight transport is a really hard to decarbonize sector. Let's, you know, if you think about maritime, aviation, truck, road. Um, but we've got a great solution already. You know, as more of our customers look at their supply chain. So uh, the average company, 90% of their emissions are in their supply chain. And a significant portion of that can be their contracted uh, transportation sources, whether that be, be truck or rail. Um, we've got a solution right now to uh, decarbonize truck transport by 75% and sometimes up to 90%. And that's freight rail. So that's a solution right now. Uh, and that's starting to resonate with a lot more of our uh, partners in the supply chain, whether it's the shipper uh, or the receiver. You know, so uh, uh, our customer base, we ship over 7 million uh, shipments a year. Um, some of those weigh over 100 tons, you know, if you think about the merchandise segment. On the container side, those are around 15 tons a piece. Um, you don't see a locomotive show up at your front door, but some of our largest customers are UPS, Amazon, FedEx, Walmart. Uh, and as you look at the cargo owners of who's actually shipping that product, uh, over 90% of our top 50 have decarbonization goals and many of those net zero goals. So it's becoming uh, you know, more apparent that a lot of the shippers are looking for a low carbon solution uh, and we can provide that for them. And a lot of that goes back to the data. How can we provide them quality data when it comes to making their, their transport uh, solutions, but also how can we provide that consistent service product like they're used to getting, getting from trucks. So that's really the, the solution we help bring to the market right now when we think about supply chain emissions. So that's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's very interesting you mentioned data, you know, we'll, we'll get to that, but you know, you're all in the business, I mean, you're, you're a commercial entity, so you're in the business of making money. Mm -hmm. Do you find it easier or more difficult now with the sustainability push or the sustainability goals? Do you find it that it is becoming uh, not just more accepted, uh, you mentioned your, your shippers have sustainability goals, but at this stage, uh, these ideas or these, these goals cost more. So how does innovation play in that space in trying to continue to be competitive in, in the market that, that you play in, but also to be able to achieve these other goals? Maybe, I don't know, you, you want to start and then we'll go to Larissa maybe. 
Yeah, so I was actually just, just hosted a, a 70 of our suppliers and in in shippers yesterday on a sustainability panel, and we talked a lot about that, of, of how is there a green premium out there for a lot of these products. And I think a lot of it, what it goes back to is the life cycle emissions. You know, so if we're buying a product such as an intermodal crane that's going to be fully electric or a hybrid unit instead of traditional diesel, it's going to cost more. Mm -hmm. But if you do the full life cycle analysis, you're actually going to save money at the end of the day. And it's also less maintenance as well. So, so I think if, if we, as we get into uh, things that are environmental advantages, you can cost it out. And really, it's better for the economics at the end of the day. And, that and that's the way we sell sustainability. It has to make economic sense. We are in business. Um, but if we can make it economical, sustainability will continue to, to go. I mean, that's, that's my vision. So the message is excellent, but how do, you, how do you leverage that or how do you convince the, uh, uh, basically your investors, you know, because they're not looking at the 30 year return, right? Or, or yeah. you know, people, you know. So, so, I, so I, meet, I meet with over half of our investors Got it. every year. Uh, and, you know, historically, they wanted to talk about governance. Yep. And over the last four years, they want to talk about environment and social. How are, you taking care of, how are you taking care of people? How are you taking care of the environment? And that's becoming a lot more important for the investors, um, particularly um, foreign investors, you know, multinationals. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the pickup. Um, for a lot of shippers and companies, they're not to the level we're at yet. Um, I would say it's about 20 25%. Um, but I think sustainability is just going to be an expectation yep. for companies. And if you're not being sustainable, who's your competition? Yep. You know, they're going to they're gonna go out there. You look at Maersk, Maritime Company. They're leading the way when it comes to shipping, and they're attracting a lot of business because of that. So it, it does make business sense. There is that same, same question. How, do you, how does innovation play in your space, and how do you, how do you balance the investment versus the uh, you know, need to make money? Right. So I oversee the new products pipeline for Ryan, and with our efforts, you know, we have to look at the market. So we're not just in the lab trying to develop new products. We have to look and see what the value is. Um, a lot of the projects that we've thought about, especially with other materials from trees, you know, from trees you have cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, and all the extractives. And so when you're looking at those, the cellulose has had value. You know, we see the applications, especially for dissolving pulp, cellulose acetate, cellulose ethers. But the challenge has been those other materials that it costs a little bit more to extract, purify, and utilize. So over the last 20 years, we've had several projects where we've looked at this and, and the, the value just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. But now with the sustainability, the, the green chemistry push, we're able to utilize the additional value to push these, these streams mm -hmm. forward. Mm -hmm. So right now, that's utilized for energy. We produce about 80% of the energy we use at our facility in Jessup. But now we're going to actually move those um, chemical or molecules over to value added applications. Um, just an example, this is a, a very interesting one that we're working on that has really just been a motivator for me over the past few years. We're using hemicellulose to go into a prebiotic for poultry, for chickens, for broiler mm -hmm. chickens. So for a prebiotic, you know, you, you're familiar with probiotics, you know, the, the good bacteria in your gut. The prebiotic is something that actually goes, you know, through your stomach. It, it works in humans as well, and it feeds the good bacteria. And so with that, it can crowd out the pathogens, the bad bacteria. And for chickens, you know, now, you know, with broiler chickens and poultry, we can't use the antibiotic growth promoters. It helps create a healthy gut that can help them fight disease. So a really unique application that now we can justify as a sustainable. Interesting. Uh, Michael, we heard a little bit about the data from uh, Josh, and uh, you know, in, in, in the space that you're in, uh, obviously having data on you know, the, the, the energy consumption and so on is probably the first step for you in order to, to be able to design and making sure that uh, you know, you're, you're uh, serving your customers. But also after that, you know, keeping monitoring and getting that information and, and using it for either better products or better services and so on. So for, you know, in this space, whatever you can say without divulging any secret, uh, you know, company secrets, you know, how, how invested are you or how, how, uh, uh, how much are you working in that space? Meaningfully, it, it's a primary driver of it. And very quickly, I'm uh, sorry, I might have gone off Il, here. Can you, yeah, if you just keep talking and I think. It will come back. It will, you will come back. Um, Ben Damiani, our CTO, says often um, 
we did not leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stone. That's true. Your, your, your question uh, of what we're doing now in this moment is largely about innovation because what we, I mean, what we do has to uh, make economic sense for our customers. We are for more than profit um, in, in what we do. And in, in selling the data component uh, of where we're investing, how we think about these uh, processing innovations. So the first ask that we make of a customer is their electricity bill. Um, and with that electricity bill, uh, we can get very detailed information about energy consumption. Um, and then the next steps of what's possible with data actually came out of uh, Georgia Tech graduates. Uh, this is four-ish years ago now. Um, some students came because uh, we were consistently looking uh, for students to say, is there an interesting problem that you're working on that we try to solve? This business is now called Watch, W-A-T-T-C-H. Um, it is a monitoring platform because there was not um, a, this is uh, industry jargon, an inverter agnostic mm. uh, monitoring platform to get revenue grade electricity data. We monitor every electron that goes into uh, and out of our customer's meter. Mm -hmm. um, and they tell me now we can, uh, I'm, I don't know film that well, but if, if you were a movie buff, you could look at uh, the energy consumption uh, mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. know what film someone's watching. And uh, there's a lot that we can do with that from a controls perspective. And is that a service that you provide on top, like, you know, on a subscription basis, you know, when you, when you present? Is it's that, all is part that of our service. We, we just so, sell but, competitively priced electricity. It's right. part of our sell of electricity. And this okay. is before we even start talking about the data sets from right. uh, battery storage. So the yeah. uh, controls and information that we're seeing now uh, and large language models uh, through AI uh, is meaningfully impacting uh, okay, the you degree just, of power. You just said the magic uh, word AI, so in, yeah, right? we had to get AI in. You know, we haven't we haven't heard yet about AI. So, uh, you know, so that that's an interesting topic by itself. But one of the issues about AI right now, well, one of the many issues about AI, is really the energy it takes to try to Huge. consume that. So. How are you handling that in your business? In, in your business, and maybe Josh and, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Michael and uh, Josh and others, yeah. Trying to write very efficiently. Um, the, the consumption that we utilize and how we're finding uh, all of that information, where we store it, and then the, basically the data hosts, mm -hmm. um, because it is circular, and as we think about yeah. the impact of that, it matters, but it, it's, it's huge. Um, the consumption of a large language model data center being built in LaGrange right now, uh, it's 1,000 acres, mm -hmm. uh, 600 megawatts, again, for power jargon. Uh, that's the equivalent of one uh, nuclear power plant at yeah. Plant Vogel in Augusta. The consumption um, from data centers is mm -hmm. just enormous. Yeah. Larissa, are you, is that, are you facing that yet? Uh, you know? We are not. We are utilizing AI for you know, some optimization of our processes, especially with research and development. It's a really good tool to use to further and expedite mm -hmm. our research, and we're trying to utilize it in different groups. Um, we just had an initiative started um, a couple weeks ago, actually, so we're still in the exploratory phase. And do you do it internally when you say we have an initiative, or do you? Okay, so you have a R&D Department we have, that we have an R well the um, the IT group is really pioneering. Okay. It. Okay. And so they're really guiding us on how to best utilize it and, and making sure that you know we did an evaluation of all the different AI platforms mm -hmm. um, to see which one would be best, which one can lock down our information as well. Yeah. Um, and so that's the way we're moving forward. Yeah. Josh. Yeah. So uh, electricity is a very small component of our total uh, energy consumption, yeah. less than three percent. You know, most of our our energy is going to be our locomotives. You know, it's over ninety percent of our, our scope one and, and two emissions. Um, but the way that we're you know utilizing AI uh, is actually a partnership we have with uh, GTRI, Georgia yeah. Tech Research Institute. Uh, we've uh, w partnered to create digital train inspection portals. So imagine a train uh, going sixty miles an hour through a shed uh, that's got thirty eight cameras equivalent to what NASA uses to watch rockets, right, when they, when they launch. Uh, it has stadium lighting, so you get quality images. Uh, we're collecting 1,000 images per rail car, something that's absolutely amazing. Um, could a person look at 1,000 images for every rail car that passes through uh, for a train? No. So we're using uh, algorithms, artificial intelligence, and machine learning uh, to help the computers to learn what's, what's a defect and what's not a defect. 
and it's just absolutely amazing what we've been able to find. Uh, Defects is a, a, a cotter pin that's the size of a dime, you know, from underneath the side of a, a rail car. Think about that. Um, but also what the, the AI is able to do as well is prioritize defects. You know, is it a defect to where you need to stop that train right now uh, to take care of something because it's safety related? Uh, or is it a defect that needs to be taken care of the next time that car is at a, at, a, at a shop for mechanical repairs? And so it's just, we're in the very early stages of this right now. We've got uh, two of these portals in place now. We anticipate having 17 in place uh, by the end of next year. And so that would basically cover somewhere between 80 and 90% of all the traffic that moves on our system. So that's, that's one application that has a lot of advantages uh, when we think about safety, when we think about how do we minimize uh, derailments, um, but also it's how do we utilize our workforce? Um, you know, how can we use our workforce to be fixers instead of finders? Okay. Utilize the machines to find the defects and take the people to actually make the improvements. Yeah, that, that's a wonderful example of what universities and, and applied research institutes like Georgia, GTRI can do uh, it's uh, I'm very familiar with this with this particular uh, collaboration because uh, uh, you know uh, GTRI researchers you know are, are proud in, in basically taking the technology or, or the learning that they they got from like you said working on rockets working on, working on uh, 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 missiles in defense and bringing it into the civilian. Um, uh, realm or into the safety for the civilian realm. So uh, that's that's a great example of, of collaboration. Any any examples you have either with Georgia Tech or other universities, Larissa? Well, I have another example that I thought of after you mentioned yours. Um, so we actually use AI on our wood yards. So with our facilities, you know, if you think of something like packaging boxes, you know, it really doesn't matter what type of tree is going into that process, hardwood, softwood. But for us, you know, we're making around 650,000 tons of high purity cellulose in Jessup. And so all of that has to be either hardwood or softwood. We have three lines, one's hardwood, one's softwood, and one is mixed. And if we have a truck get mixed up and dump hardwood into softwood, then we have to throw out the whole pile. You know, that will, you know, our customer process just cannot utilize it, even if it's just a few fibers. And so with that, we utilize AI to look at the wood chips. And so that, it can actually monitor to see what the characteristics are, and it'll tell us before, you know, we have an accident happen, whether there's hardwood, softwood contamination. And, and that particular technology is something you develop or you, you bought uh, from? We used it from outside, and I'm not sure where it comes from because okay. I'm not as close to that area. Okay. But looking specifically at our collaborations with Georgia Tech, um, you know, we're members of the Renewable Bioproducts Institute. You know, this is the old Institute of Paper Science. Um, you know, so the, the history is extensive. We actually had a um, principal scientist just retire that was a professor for the Institute. So our relations date back years and years. Um, so there, you know, we look at the cutting edge research that's going on. You know, Georgia Tech is always at the forefront of what's happening. You know, this is what, you know, where the industry is going. Um, specifically, the Rewood initiative that was just started, yeah. um, xylo chemistry, what else can we do with trees? Um, you know, with our efforts, um, with biomaterials, we were getting into that area, but this is really furthering it exponentially. And do you ship wood, uh, Josh? How do you ship your... your we do. Okay, yeah. just making sure here, you don't have a... Uh, we use uh, trucks, rail, <laughs> not everything. And Michael, how about, how about you? Any, uh, what, what are the engagements either with Georgia Tech or with other universities in terms of the uh, innovation or of course. solutions? Uh, so we've got several um, that are ongoing. In addition to being members of the Center for Distributed Generation, mm -hmm. um, with the sustainability initiatives that, that exist across the university, our team is really engaged. You've got uh, great work happening with Drawdown, uh, which yeah. is the process of taking very specific yeah. steps uh, to um, incorporate um, across all, all work streams. Uh, from a research perspective, we're working uh, electric engineers, uh, and it's AI connected, but basically uh, we have these great data sets from pictures, uh, and so we're working with a team right now uh, on effectively uh, getting CAD designs further along in the design process uh, because the biggest bottleneck in delivering renewable power uh, to the system right now uh, is electrical engineering design work. Um, and so there's a lot you of... you elaborate on that? What do you, what do you mean? Uh, oh, of course. So we do, we do now take a... Um, we're working with some software engineers uh, mm -hmm. at Georgia Tech, um, as well as a third-party firm, uh, to take 
uh, drone photos, and then it's a 3D camera that can walk through a facility, uh, stitch all of that information, and uh, populate it into AutoCAD. Uh, to, uh, and then there's a decision tree uh, electrically of all sorts of different uh, components to include uh, how to piece those together and getting all of that information uh, into the system. I really like your uh, alliteration of a, uh, a fixer versus a finder, but yeah. uh, previously our designers were uh, encumbered with finding all of the issues uh, of a possible design. We now can uh, route the optimized path for conduit and, and things like this uh, just to design um, safer uh, systems faster. And, and your, your uh, space is large uh, large industries or large large spaces, or can you exactly. you don't you don't we sell don't do to residential. you don't do residential on this. Okay, uh, there are companies who do that. Obviously, are they are they? Yeah, so you, it's amazing how early innings it is in this what we call Energy 2.0. This mm -hmm. transition yeah. from uh, central distribution power plants to distributed generation. Yeah. Uh, Georgia Tech's on the forefront uh, in a number of different challenges uh, in how we think about this and dispatchable power. Uh, but the same way that we didn't have an operating system or monitoring yeah. uh, for basic equipment, uh, there aren't basic design tools. Yeah. All of, and this is why these collaborations, we've yeah. done two capstone projects so far. Okay. Uh, we'll start uh, next week, actually. This is an amazing example of undergraduate research. Right. Uh, we did undergrad capstone projects with the city of Atlanta uh, for the Hemp Hill Reservoir. We'll do floating solar. Yeah. Uh, and on Bolton Road uh, at the Chattahoochee plant, you'll see a ground mount installation. In both instances, there were pretty basic questions. Uh, will what uh, the Georgia Tech students called biofouling, we previously had called goose poop, uh, will more geese nest uh, on solar panels uh, in a pond? And it turns out no, because geese need space to land. And if you cover it uh, with solar panels, it was so good. Uh, and the second was, if we do a ground mount on top of wells, uh, will it create an issue? And the answer is no, because if you take off an inch of dirt, uh, and then you put three to five pounds uh, of uh, force on it, uh, that will not impact it because it's an equivalence uh, and it's mm -hmm. just an inch of dirt on top of wells. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a capstone project that was presented to the city through Georgia Tech Research. Mm -hmm. um, and so those, I mean, it'll start next month. It's amazing. But until we were able to say, yeah. we've collaborated with some really smart engineers uh, yeah. on the forefront at Georgia Tech, yeah. um, you can put this uh, on top of it. And so it's been a wonderful partnership. Yeah, that, that's great. I'm glad you mentioned the undergraduate research. We have a lot of these programs. Yeah, we have one I mean, called... the PhDs are important, but there's so many folks that are coming through that do uh, such uh, great work. Absolutely, and, and uh, the undergraduates, not only do we have the, the, the smarts and the skills and the numbers, but also, in, in many cases, uh, their passion in, to, to work in these areas is okay. a, lot, a lot more uh, current. So mission focus. Exactly, yeah. uh, and, and also, uh, in many cases, uh, you know, they, they don't know what they don't know in some ways, you know, so they can try a lot more innovative things. So uh, uh, you're familiar with it. Was, you said it was, a, it was a capstone project, but we have this uh, program called VIP, the Vertically Integrated Project. Yes. Is, that, is that what it was? No. Uh, oh, okay. So it was, was a, yeah. a capstone it. through uh, the Scheller School of Business. Okay. So yeah, yeah, was yeah. An uh, MBA Great. program, and the other was uh, on the ag, uh, undergraduate side. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Josh, a question about how do you, how do you balance the demand for innovative products with, uh, with maintaining sustainability standards across the, the uh, supply chain? And you know, I think we touched on it a little bit before, but how do you, how do you manage that tension between, okay, I wanna do you know, great things, but you know, I have these standards that I also have to go by? Yeah, so I mean, it is a, a limiting factor is capital expenditure money, right? Yeah. So we're, we're highly, um, capital expenditures. If you think about all the infrastructure that's privately maintained by us on an annual basis, but also our locomotive fleet of, of 3,000 locomotives. Um, How many? 3,000 locomotives or so. Um, but if you think about the investments we're making in that locomotive fleet, we're modernizing over 100 units a year. Um, and it makes sense. It's, you're taking a unit that's 20, 25 years of age, totally modernizing that unit with the latest technology. To put it in perspective, uh, we've got more sensors on a locomotive than a Tesla has. There's a lot of technology. When I started with the company 27 years ago, I don't think there was a computer you know, on a, on a locomotive. Uh, and our company's been around 200 years. So, uh, so we're really innovating uh, and we're, we're improving fuel efficiency at the same time. So about 25% fuel efficiency with every single one of those modernizations. So that really helps sell it to your chief financial officer. Yeah. You have those fuel savings. That is our third largest cost as well. So over a billion dollars a year. 
uh, that we're spending on fuel. I think one of the challenges we, we see uh, in the space of transport is low carbon fuels. You know, if you think about biofuels, renewable diesel, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, uh, there's a cost premium for a lot of these products. And so that's where we're kind of at now is like, we need the production to ramp up, but we need incentives right now to help us afford that. Or we need customers willing to pay that green premium. So, so if it cost us, uh, let's say $20 more to move a, a container, you know, from, from Savannah to, to Atlanta, and there's 2,000 pairs of Adidas on there, is Adidas, you know, willing to pay that $20 to pass along that cost to the consumer that may be a penny, right? So, so the green shipping alternative is actually fairly inexpensive if we have the production of the low carbon fuels to support that on the supply. And I think we think about the innovation. Uh, you know, I think uh, a lot of there's a lot of opportunity there in the biomass space. Yeah. You know, of taking biomass and turning that into renewable fuels, uh, cross ties. You know, we have to replace over two million railroad cross ties a year. There's a huge opportunity there to take that material. We have a lot of feedstocks that we're currently burying in landfills. Let's be straight, there's a lot of waste. And we really need to focus on that waste and use innovative techniques to extract everything we can. Um, Larissa, could you take us maybe through the successful launch, design, uh, production of, of a sustainable product? You mentioned a couple, but you know, maybe well, the one I mentioned previously is, is not quite commercial, but following up to your biofuels example, um, with the waste that we have from our process, we have a lot of residual sugars. So cellulose, nature's most abundant polymer, hemicellulose, all of that has sugars associated. So mm -hmm. glucose, xylose, mannose, all of those that come from our process that generally you know, are utilized as fuel. Um, in France, we have um, four manufacturing sites, Canada, France, Jessup, Georgia, and then Fernandina Beach, Florida. Mm -hmm. In France, we took one of our facilities and we're making bioethanol. So we're taking the residual sugar, we're fermenting it with yeast or you know, some kind of organism that will make the ethanol, and then utilizing it for biofuels. Mm -hmm. um, there's other pathways that you can um, go from ethanol to sustainable aviation fuel, things like that, and that may be something we look at in the future. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an exciting opportunity. And that um, facility should be up and running in, within the next couple of weeks. In France? In France. But we are also um, exploring the opportunity in Fernandina Beach. Yeah. Since the facilities are similar okay. um, and then may expand in the future. Well, uh, the French connection sounds interesting. You know, I was wondering when you said sugar, if they can make any other type of alcohol from it. That's not... Uh... <laughs> well, our other R&D location um, outside of Jessup is in Bordeaux. Oh, ah, well, there you go. It's <laughs> there quite you go. a nice location to visit. visit. Yeah. So can you call it... Yeah, it, it has the appellation. Okay, great. That's, a, that's wonderful. Uh, um, let's see, Michael. So you, we talked a little bit about this before. So sustainability or, or really shifting... Uh, businesses, uh, business directions requires investments. Uh, and you, we've talked about, okay, if you think about it long term, you know, yeah, it does pay for itself and, you know, there's other social responsibility and so on. But do you find it right now that either the, the, uh, the management and, and in your case, you, you, are you public yet? No. Ah, well, that's much easier. So how do you convince yourself that you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> We, we do have the luxury of being, uh, well, no one operates alone, to be fair. Yeah. Um, but not having to deal with some of the scrutiny uh, that yeah. exists in uh, quarterly reporting, we're building a 100-year business. And so yeah. what is yeah. wonderful about having a long-term view uh, is that we think that we have full alignment. And I'd, we think that it's sort of, we don't have the possession of truth. Uh, but we definitely are in the pursuit yeah. of it. And we think that our business model being a sustainable one is, is the right way uh, to build something for profit. Um, and, and we certainly, as we talk about our mission of doing good and doing well, think often about this, but it gets back to Ben's point. If we, we think our technology is, is better mm -hmm. um, in selling electricity uh, less expensively, actually. I mean, we have uh, all deal sustainability matter. Uh, with our customers. It, it's the primary entry point of discussions uh, as we do this, but we spend much more time uh, talking about the financial impact of these in capital markets uh, to which we are a serial issuer because we uh, use capital to pay for the infrastructure yeah. which we install. 
Um, and so we need, as I mentioned to you before, 20 to 30 year agreements with customers yeah. uh, to sell predictably priced electricity. Relies, uh, requires a lot of capital, but because of that, um, and because we've had time to ramp some of these technologies, uh, the first solar panel was in Georgia in 1953 with Bell Labs, uh, with work that was happening here. Um, ben Damiani, our CTO, uh, when he received his PhD, his dissertation ultimately would become a business uh, uh, called Ceneva, the first uh, domestic commercialization uh, of this photovoltaic cell. Mm -hmm. Uh, and now we sell our electricity uh, for less than uh, most often the prevailing uh, utility rates. And for the utility as well, uh, solar power is now the least expensive form uh, of generation, which is a great mm -hmm. uh, story of, of innovation, both solving a problem that we need for sustainability, uh, but also an economic problem because we have to have viable uh, business models uh, for any of this uh, momentum to be successful. So uh, is that... It, does that require policy changes or does that require uh, political will? What, what is it that you know, we need in order to make it a little bit more uh, uh, beneficial or, or financially viable? Yeah, of course. So It's a safe um, space here. You can talk <laughs> politics. <laughs> we are a, uh, an apolitical uh, organization uh, in how we operate. Mm -hmm. um, However, the regulatory environment has uh, deeply impacted yeah. um, energy markets. Uh, we had until 2015 in Georgia uh, a utility monopoly, and that uh, mm -hmm. generally is true nationally. Those regulations started to change about 15 years ago. Uh, our business, Cherry Street, uh, became the first private sale of electricity okay. uh, in Georgia uh, in 2015. Uh, and so as, as that expands and this uh, accelerates across the southeast uh, in the country, um, there are now 38 states that have competitive electricity markets. Um, 38. 38. Okay. And, and it will change yeah. um, because we're capitalist and it's a right. free market system right. and it's better technology. Uh, but it has to be done responsibly. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. maybe in, you know, rail has an um, absolutely safety first mentality and as does uh, power and utilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we can't go fast and break things uh, in our innovations. Mm -hmm. we, we have to be uh, very careful uh, in what we do. Um, so working collaboratively with the utilities, um, this transition continues to accelerate, and there'll be regulatory change to support that. Yeah, and and we were talking before you're installing solar panels on the Science Square. The, yeah, yeah. The new. Oh, so great. Yeah. Um, so a wonderful example of public-private partnership. Uh, there's a real estate developer uh, called Trammell Crow who is coordinating uh, with Georgia Tech uh, for a public-private partnership, uh, and because of uh, Georgia Tech's. Uh, insistence that they wanted uh, renewable power incorporated in the facility. Trammell Crow, Crow, rightly as a public entity, said, what is the m most um, capital efficient way of incorporating renewable power in a facility? Uh, and it is through businesses like Cherry Street that sell electricity at no capital expense. Mm -hmm. They pay less for their electricity. Uh, and they incorporated renewable power uh, to meet Georgia Tech's um, request. And what's the size? What's the, the amount of electricity? Yeah, so it's a yeah. parking canopy on Science Square that you'll see at yeah. the top. There's uh, about 650 kilowatts okay. uh, of capacity that'll power the common area yeah. uh, in the facility. And it's a, it's a very, very exciting uh, project for us. Nice, yeah. Uh, so let's switch gears and think about the future. So we've talked about what you're doing. We've talked about you know the belief that this is a long-term investment. Do you see any technologies in your space, anything that you're watching. And, you know, you can say AI, but, you know, we've already covered that. So, you know, if there's anything else that you think, okay, it will be, we're watching this or this is something maybe we should be looking into? So for us in the manufacturing space, um, we are looking towards the capture of biogenic carbon um, for value-added chemicals. Okay. So we just had an announcement of a memorandum of understanding with Verso Energy in France looking to capture our CO2 to possibly make sustainable aviation fuel. Okay. And so with that technology, we see a lot of potential. You know, yes, we're doing it in France initially. Oh, that's great. But there's we're, the We're going to go get the wine. Yeah, the Bordeaux. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds exciting. It sounds very... How about you, Josh? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the partnerships I'd like to highlight is, uh, is Rail Pulse. So if you think about the North American rail car fleet, uh, we only actually own about a third of the cars that we ship on the railroad. Uh, most of those are owned by the shipper or leased by the shipper, and we transport their product in, in those rail cars. Um, rail cars are very heavy. They're also not very aerodynamic. 
So, you know, working with, with partners uh, like the Greenbrier Company, uh, we've uh, helped support Greenbrier Company and U.S. Steel create a gondola that weighs 15,000 pounds less than the traditional gondola. So that means you can put 15,000 more pounds of product in that gondola, right? And so for the shipper, that's less rail cars that they have to support at their facility. Uh, so it helps in your fuel efficiency. And also there's a huge amount of empty repositioning uh, for truck, but also for rail as well. So the lighter and more aerodynamic, uh, you know, we can make those rail cars uh, that's going to help with the, the fuel efficiency significantly. Uh, just this design alone is improving the fuel efficiency 7%. So that's, that's the one thing we're doing kind of toward the future. Uh, there's a lot of other opportunities on the rail cars as well. Um, but the other thing is how do we get more people to ship via rail? And part of that is visibility, transparency. Where is your shipment? Whether it's we own the rail car, uh, what railroads it on? Maybe that's on a container that got moved from rail to truck now. And so how do we develop a platform for a shipper to go in and look at all of their shipments, no matter where they are? And so that's the technology we're developing right now called Rail Pulse. So think of like it's, a, it's telematics like you would have, uh, you know, on your vehicle, but it's actually equipped, you know, GPS devices on every rail car. Uh, so there's nine partners right now. Uh, together we own about 35% of the North American rail car fleet. And we think we could get to a point to where we could have 100% of that rail car fleet uh, converted. It's not just tracking, it's also sensors. Think of all the Bluetooth sensors you can add on that rail car as well. You know, a lot of the product we ship is, is um, moisture sensitive, temperature sensitive. Uh, you can put cameras inside of, of the, the rail cars as well. So when the, the top is open, the, the customer can see how much product is left in there. Um, it's also safety as well. You know, if, if that car is impacted over a certain amount, it sends off an alert. So you know the car was impacted, somebody needs to go check that car. Uh, it may be leaking, you know, something, something like a Kimball or something like that. So it has environmental advantages as well. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's about the shipper, providing them the necessary information they need, like they would get from their phone, if they're tracking their Amazon package or their, you know, their UPS package. And that's what the consumers expect these days. And the people that make logistics decisions, they're consumers, right? They're personal consumers. You know, you think of the, the iPhone, you know, 17 years ago. How has that changed the world? You know, think of what Amazon's able to do just because of the iPhone. And that's what we expect now, you know, when we track our shipments. So over 50% of the shipments that we touch, touch at least one other railroad, right? And so for the customer, we really got to add the transparency uh, that they can see what's going on with their shipments if we want to compete with truck. Nice, yeah. Michael, any trends? Solid, solid state batteries. Solid state batteries. You went for the easy one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> you might could just crack the code. It yeah, feels yeah. like it's really close. It likely will come out of Georgia Tech, it seems. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you'll call, we move our storage, office. storage, right? I mean, because storage, yeah, batteries, yeah, yeah, you got, yeah, 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 yeah. is going to uh, fundamentally change yep. Um, yep. how we can address distributed generation and what that yeah. means for the overall system and system reliability. Yeah. Um, we design all of our systems now for the incorporation of battery storage, but um, the cost of it um, is, is still more expensive than traditional uh, sources of power. Uh, that will change in time uh, and not having to cycle, you know, you get 5,000 or 7,000 cycles. Yeah. Uh, on a um, lithium ion phosphate battery um, and a solid state battery would, would fundamentally change how to think about that cost dynamic. Are, are you aware of the work being done here on campus? With, on, uh, okay, great, yeah. Uh, so you, since you mentioned batteries, I mean, one of the issues with batteries is, of course, recycling. You know, once, you, once it comes to its end, end of life, you know, so how do you, how do you guys deal with that? Not well. Yeah. Um, it, it's the same as Josh says. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm a relativist, which they tell me in counseling sessions is not constructive, but the, uh, the amount of landfill necessary yeah. to recycle yeah. all of the batteries isn't even close. Like, you can't yeah. show the chart because you got to break it. It's so yeah. far different with coal ash and spent nuclear. I mean, it, yeah. however... We need to address it, uh, and there are a number of ways to be able to do so. And certainly on the solar photovoltaic side, you saw a wonderful announcement in the last two months yeah. of a, a recycling plant that will happen in Georgia. Um, ours are all domestically produced, and 99% of them are recyclable. Um, but for some of the um, chemistry in the batteries, um, yeah. there's more to do. 
So I got to introduce you to the folks at GTRI because they have they have an initiative or they have a group working on you know basically taking care of the batteries at the end of life, separating that would be great. separating the material, recycling, and so on. It, it's it's both a an environmental issue but a national security issue. As you know, most of the material doesn't you know we don't uh, mine it here and so on. So. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left, and you know the, the panelists uh, are willing to answer some of your questions, if you have any. If not, we'll uh, we'll continue our discussions. Yeah, we have someone out there. <laughs> well, you can, but. <laughs> Appreciate y'all taking the time to have the discussion today. A question for Josh. Has there been any discussion or research or consideration around using hydrogen uh, for freight engines? No, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, they've been running uh, uh, passenger trains in, in Europe for some time on hydrogen uh, fuel cells. Um, whole different energy application, though, as you think of freight rail, right? A lot higher demands, a lot more uh, energy uh, that's required. I would say that uh, Canadian Pacific uh, is, is probably leading the way for that. Canadian government sponsoring a project there. They've got three units that they've actually done in-house uh, themselves working with a, a fuel cell provider. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that, that plays out. The units are just now in, in the piloting stage, uh, very, very early. I would say one of the challenges with hydrogen is the energy density. So you would have to have a, a tender behind every locomotive. So think of, I mean, that's... I mean, that's where, you would have to, that's where you'd have to get, let's go on back in time, right? Um, and also the safety concern of getting a tender approved. Uh, but there is a company, CNG Motive, that already has a, a tender going through process for, uh, for compressed natural gas that they think they can utilize that for hydrogen as well. So I think it's going to be a, an interesting play of how that, uh, how that develops. I think, um, you know, injected hydrogen into existing internal combustion engines is probably the nearest term opportunity. Uh, because if you think of the whole fueling infrastructure network that you would have to change, you know, the whole diesel infrastructure for the current freight rail. So think of there's 30,000 diesel locomotives, you know, in North America right now. If you create a, a diesel injected hydrogen unit, uh, would you have to keep it in captive service, you know, on a certain line? Uh, what if hydrogen is not available? The nice thing about that is you can inject up to 50% hydrogen, but if you're in a location where it's not available, you just use 100% diesel. So I think that's a, a near-term opportunity. It's already kind of been proven in the, the trucking industry. There's a lot of folks working in the Class 8 truck space, uh, and I think that's a, a great opportunity for trucking as we think about long-haul trucking. I don't think it's going to be batteries. Yeah. But no, great question. Yeah. Anyone else? There you go. Thank you guys again for the panel. This is wonderful. Um, I had a question about uh, how your businesses are being impacted by the uh, Inflation Reduction Act um, and uh, how you're preparing for possible changes to that, um, you know, depending on the election outcomes coming up in November. Uh, if you could, no as much as you can discuss. No, you can talk about it. You have a specific, I mean, you yeah, can answer it. I mean, as you're likely aware, 30 to 40% of our capitalization of the infrastructure we invest in is influenced by the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, extended in the renewable power space. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the investment tax credit that was passed under the George W. Bush administration um, that was uh, extended uh, both by the Obama administration and the um, Trump administration. Um, before the Inflation Reduction Act passed. Uh, the primary beneficiaries are large banks, um, followed by other large uh, either real estate uh, corporations or, or holders of the tax credits uh, that come from the act. On the manufacturing side, um, as you would have heard as, as recently of last night, at least half of those uh, have gone into districts um, that you know, would, would make it seem that it's balanced uh, in communities that have received support. So to think about um, revisions coming to it or overturning it, um, most are advising that it feels pretty unlikely. If it did occur for our specific business, um, we built uh, our entire framework to exist uh, to stand absent any tax credits. It was always just kind of the, the Scheller 101 would say, don't build a business based off of success of something that by the stroke of a pen could make your business go away. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our, just the unit economics, the business fundamentals of how we contract and sell electricity uh, stands without it. However, 
as a shareholder in our business, having non-dilutive equity come by way of a tax credit uh, has been a wonderful accelerant uh, to sell less expensive electricity uh, and go faster. So we hope that it doesn't get overturned for sure. Mm. I know with us, we are monitoring it as far as moving forward with our biofuel efforts in the U.S., um, but as far as, you know, whether we move forward, it, it's just a wait-and-see approach at this point for November. A lot of ours is dependent right now on RED2 out of Europe, so the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, and so that's another one, you know, with any kind of policy, you just have to monitor it to make sure that that's still going to be the case. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it, it's nothing that's going to affect us, but it may affect what we do moving forward. Does it affect you? Uh, not really. It could, it could affect our customers, though. Yeah. You know, so that's that's really the, the the customer base that we're thinking about. If you think about the whole uh, EV supply chain that's that's yeah. that's been developed, right? Uh, we're a part of that supply chain. You know, we move the the products that make the batteries. We move the batteries. They're big, heavy items. Uh, you know, we're the largest uh, shipper of automobiles in North America, and the, the parts that go into those. So. Uh, so yeah, it could uh, affect some of the you know the facilities that we serve. There's a ton of other regulatory stuff that I think underscores your question that yeah. like uncertainty is not good for anyone. The right. SEC rules that came out this week, I think, right yep. uh, on scope one and scope two emissions. I mean, it's been um, assumed that this would happen, uh, but these are major corporations and organizations now that in public filings uh, have to report things and put infrastructure in place. That EY said they're going to hire a hundred thousand people somehow. Um, to just help um, solve this question. Um, and then for that to get ripped back um, is yeah. frustrating, I think, for corporations. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you guys for being here. Um, this is a question for Josh. So how have you navigated the changes that have been brought forth with sustainability, mainly with dealing with people that are working like on the train tracks or people that are or partnerships with the trucking companies, the people that are driving the trucks. Because I think that's a little bit different than just investors and people working up in the company. So specifically, how do we engage with the employer? Or how have you like introduced the changes that sustainability has brought um, and how are they receiving them? Yeah, so we've actually started our sustainability journey in 2007. So we were one of the early U.S. companies to really embrace sustainability and actually create it as part of our culture. I think that at the end of the day, you know, uh, safety is good for business and sustainability is good for business. And I think that's what our message is, is when we go out to our workforce, but also uh, as we engage others that are, that are within our supply chain. Um, is how do we drive that message home? And it's a lot of messaging. You know, it takes time. It takes a lot of effort. Sustainability is a journey. You're not going to get all that buy-in immediately, um, but it's shifting. And I would say it's shifting a lot with the younger generation. You know, a lot of our, our new hires, um, you know, just in Atlanta alone, we've hired 700 people at our headquarters just in the last three years. And these are mostly younger folks that are coming into our company. Uh, a lot of Georgia Tech graduates, not surprisingly, we've got over 100 employees uh, that are Georgia Tech grads. Um, and so it's not by coincidence that our headquarters is located right here <laughs> next to Tech Square. So it's, uh, so it's really about engaging in partnerships. I would say that when we, uh, we d developed five pillars of our sustainability strategy here about four years ago, and one of those was suppliers when we first started. We thought, hey, this is going to be important, right? We don't make fuel. We don't make locomotives. We're going to have to work with our supply chain. But as we matured, that changed into partnerships. Uh, because we realized it's more, it's, it's research, it's working with our industry peers, it's working with government. And so it's a much more holistic uh, focus now as we bring together the, the folks that are a part of our supply chain. So I think it's a, you know, we're, we've all got this little piece of the jigsaw puzzle that we need to work on, uh, but we also need to connect with the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that are, that are around us, you know, if we're really going to make sustainability last. Yeah. One more. So my name is Violeta, and I am actually working with the Office of Sustainability here at Tech and um, the solar implementation with Cherry Street, actually. Um, so um, <laughs> my question is kind of two-part. So obviously, um, there's companies like Cherry Street where you can um, buy electricity directly, or there's companies that sell you solar panels, and you make that first capital investment. Um, so the two-question part is, one, um, you know, your, your input on how Cherry Street kind of is, is better versus doing that initial um, capital investment. And then the second part is we talked about, obviously, um, the environmental benefits that are, are there and then the data sets that you get and, like, the, the you know, like, the complexity that you guys are working on. Um, but I want to know if there's any other features that kind of set you guys apart in a way. 
um, you talked about maintenance, so maybe you can expand on like what the maintenance yep. looks like of the panels. You've hit it a core question for us that um, I would suggest we're still working on doing a better job of, of telling me, so you'll both give feedback and help us uh, as we think about exactly those two questions, which are core questions for every customer that we ever sit down with. Um, the underlying thesis, when I started the business in 2015 when the law changed, uh, to me, it was this idea, it's what we call Energy 2.0, but in this new system, we're not going to have central distribution power plants mm -hmm. put poles in the ground and hang wire because it's less efficient. This is the, like, when we run out of stone piece. The right way to build the system, the built environment, will incorporate renewable power on every structure that can support it. If you're in California, it's because it's the law, but practically, same in France. Um, if, uh, if you're here, and this gets down to some of the question before, of like we find most often a lot of people want this. They say, I'd like control uh, of doing that, which then gets to this other question, because there are all sorts of personal efficiencies that can come for a consumer of electricity when they have control over that environment, reliability and a number of other things. So then the next question is, do I want to own it or do I want someone else to? And some of this is a financing question because there is so much capital expense. We're not gonna fully change the system as it operates. That is to say, everyone today pays for electrons, no one pays for power plants unless you're a major industrial. Um, and so there are some cases where there's someone that owns a biomass plant or things like this. But if you're the city of Atlanta or Fulton County, Macon, Bibb County, Athens, Clark County, our, our customer base, municipalities, universities, schools, hospitals, you, you work on doing exactly what you do and you want a partner uh, to collaborate with to provide renewable electricity and not have to say if you're a mayor, who was it that put solar panels on Fire Station 17? Um, we worked with, I mean, I think I can say here, even though recorded, uh, an, another county who said, well, we're thinking about wanting to do this ourselves. Uh, so can you go through both? Tell us what it costs for panels and tell us what it costs for power. Uh, and we went down and I asked and I said, hey, we looked on public records and it says that you've got 18 electricians in the city. So maybe we should offer this. And the lady who was the head of those purported 18 electricians said, we, I don't know where you got your public records, but we have one electrician that could work on this. Uh, and he's 70. Um, and so when we talk practically about this broad implementation, if you imagine that every building is going to have this, and then just one other piece that's not solar specific gets back to storage, every single building is going to have a battery, and every home is going to have a battery inclusive of two huge batteries, most often for an average uh, home, uh, that are going to plug in at night too, and dispatchable power. So when you think about from a network perspective, yeah. Rather than having 2.6 million batteries with specific customer contracts, uh, what most likely will happen is there's going to be a network of virtual batteries that are tied together with a single owner. And Cherry Street Energy is a power company that owns that distributed generation. And quite practically, we will have efficiencies of scale uh, over someone that's just looking to sell someone panels. So uh, the unit economics and cost are better. Uh, and then fortunately now for us, as we're vertically integrated, um, our alignment with our customers is much, much closer uh, in the delivery of that service. And I don't mean it disparagingly of people uh, that sell panels, but just practically from a capital perspective, mm -hmm. they get paid one time. Uh, and so their incentive is to sell panels as expensively as possible um, and install them as inexpensively as possible. We own the system. Uh, we only get paid if that system's working, and so we think it's a better alignment of incentives uh, with us and our customer uh, to, to serve them. Well, uh, thank you. That was, that was a, an excellent two-parters to two-party questions. What are you getting your PhD in? An undergrad. I told you, you know, you gotta start with the undergrads, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. I knew. I'm sorry. Yeah. So thank you. And, and thank you to the panelists uh, for, for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I, I think one thing I took away from this, along with a lot of information about going to Bordeaux and trying, trying that the new alcohol that you guys are coming up with. And uh, yeah. But uh, uh, it, it's really this idea of a virtuous cycle. You know, we started talking about the. Uh, uh, the GTRI solutions that now are being used uh, uh, by, uh, uh, by, uh, by the company, by uh, Norfolk Southern. But I have another example where 
technology that was developed for the Air Force was used for the planes, the Delta planes that you're on. Most of us, I think, probably take Delta. You know, the, the uh, entertainment center there is wirelessly uh, uh, connected. Uh, that was something that uh, GTRI, based on their expertise from uh, working with the Air Force, that they, they were the ones to design it. So thank you, GTRI. It saved a lot of cabling on the plane, saved fuel. But the interesting part about that is Delta has a lot of expertise in keeping planes up in the air, a lot more than the U.S. Air Force. So Delta helped, through GTRI, helped the U.S. Air Force to do that. So I think this idea of having government see the basic research, which is what the universities do, connect with companies like yours, and have students, the talent that goes to transfer, translate or transfers the knowledge, and then comes back with problems that can be solved that will benefit everyone is, is really the, 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 best, uh, the best story that we can tell. So thank you again for the panelists. I appreciate it. Thank you for the audience. And uh, I guess that concludes this panel. And with that, am I concluding everything? No, you guys are going to do it. So. And we're going to have uh, Beryl talk to you. But thank you all for being you. here for the panel. And thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, job, nice. So this, this was a really exciting week. I got a few messages saying um, that it sets a very positive tone to see all this abundance of research that's happening on campus, all the very creative education that's happening on campus, all the partnerships that we've talked about throughout the week, and especially the energy of our students. So I come out of this week um, redoubling my commitment, and I hope that you all feel the same way, to advancing sustainability at Georgia Tech. And of course, just like our industry partnerships are very important um, between Georgia Tech and uh, the outside world, in our little inside world, our partnerships are very important as well. So I want to take this opportunity to thank our partners, um, IRIs, Strategic Energy Institute, um, Renewable Byproducts Institute, IPAT, the Racy Anderson Center for Sustainable Business, very instrumental in putting together this panel, uh, the Office of Sustainability, um, who else am I forgetting, SCORE, and INS. Well, yeah, so I'm, I'm standing here for Brook Byers Institute today. <laughs> Student organizations like Students Organizing for Sustainability, Electrify GT, and so on. And if I'm forgetting you, I don't mean to forget you. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. And I especially want to thank the team. Trisha, you did a fantastic job. The vision. <laughs> at, the, at the first meeting, our wise advisor said, we should really keep this to one and a half days. But then it, the ideas kept coming, and it kept expanding. And in the end, we ended up with a sustainability showcase that was woven throughout a week of SDG activities that were uh, you know, so, so inspiring. Uh, there was a mobile film festival. There were so many stu uh, student-led events and projects as well. So once again, thank you, and onward. Thank you.